So hello and welcome everybody to our December uh, Home Dialysis Journal Club hosted here at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Today uh, presenting for us is uh, Dr. Russell Lung. He's one of our uh, first year nephrology fellows. Uh, Russell did his uh, medical school training at Michigan State University College of Osteopathic Medicine, and he did his internal medicine residency at Beaumont Hospital, uh, Oakland University, and he's now with us here at Vanderbilt, and today is going to talk to us about a recently published paper about the efficacy of potassium supplementation in hypokalemic PD patients. Russell, take it away. All right, thank you uh, for that introduction, Dr. Alshami. Um, I guess I don't have to introduce myself. Um, and uh, the article, like Dr. Alshami says, um, it's the efficacy of potassium supplementation in hyperclinic patients. So um, these are, oh, wait, real quick, I got there we go. So I don't really have any disclosures, um, but I do want to give a quick shout out to Dr. Al Shami for helping pick um, the article for me and also helping guide the presentation for me. Um, before we get started, um, this is the agenda for today. I thought about um, going over why potassium is relevant and important, as well as some basic concepts about potassium metabolism and supplementation and peritoneal dialysis for the first half of the presentation um, before diving into the paper itself. Um, feel free to raise your hands in the chat or interrupt with questions or anything like that. Um, I unfortunately am handling two screens right now, so I'll rely on Dr. Oshami to, to look at the chat group and help me uh, figure out if there's any questions or not. All right, so before we get into potassium, the paper itself, I think it's always important to acknowledge um, and highlight why we do Home Dialysis Journal Club and why it's increasingly important to discuss about. Um, the use of peritoneal dialysis kind of varies worldwide. You can see in the, the paper here, and this var variability likely results from the different characteristics of healthcare systems. Um, so this is data that's extracted from the 2012 on the right, and then a little bit more recent on the left here is the 2021 data. So for example, we look at Hong Kong up here, um, where there's a PD first policy, up to 71% of patients use PD, whereas in Mexico in the graph to the Left, 61% of patients use PD likely um, due to the uh, lack of availability of other forms of dialysis. In countries such as Canada, Australia, um, where there's like a strong, robust education programs, approximately 20 to 30% of patients use PD. And in contrast, when we look at the US, um, the PD prevalence reached a low of 6.9% in 2009, although the prevalence has been increasing up to um, 10.1% in 2017, and it's somewhat been stable to increasing since then. Um, so I did highlight that Thailand here in the red because that's where the journal club, um, where this article actually takes place. Um, and it's important to note that the Thai government um, has chosen PD um, as the modality of choice since 2007 for renal replacement therapy. So numbers have been increasing since then. And I'll go a little bit into the specifics, specifics later on when we start talking about the paper about um, uh, what these numbers are. Um, so stay tuned and uh, keep awake for it. So switching gears and homing into potassium itself, why is hypokalemia important? Well, we know hypokalemia is associated with cardiovascular effects, including arrhythmias, heart failure, and as well as uh, mortality muscular effects, including its effects on uh, skeletal muscle and um, smooth muscle, particularly in the GI tract, um, which we will talk about more in, a, in the paper um, and the physiology of it itself. In fact, there was a study in Brazil um, that was done not too long ago called the BRAS PD study, which looked at hypokalemia infection cause mortality in PD patients. Um, we won't get too much into detail of the study because this isn't the focus, um, but they essentially narrow followed these PD patients between 2004 and 2011 in Brazil and accumulated data from about 1,817 patients that were matched and narrowed down based on a list of criteria. Um, they looked at severe effects. And if you turn your attention to the graph, I'm gonna pull both of them, the graph on the right here, um, we can see, well, the graph on the left, actually, we'll go, go start that one first. We can see the cardiovascular effects in hypokalemia. So um, CIF is reported on the y-axis, and it's essentially the cumulative uh, incidence factor for the primary factor of interest. Um, so in this case, cardiovascular mortality. And when we compare it with the reference levels of 4 to 4.4, um, potassium serum levels that was less than 4 were associated with cardiovascular mortality, um, up to those less than 3.5, so more severe hypokalemia, 
um, with standard hazard ratios of 1.57. And then those between 3.5 to 3.9 with standard hazard ratios of 1.29, as you can see here. When we look at, similarly, when we look at overall mortality itself, um, we can again see a higher cumulative incidence factor in the hypokalemic group. So in fact, when they plotted out both um, the mortality and cardiovascular mortality against potassium, serum potassium levels, we can see a U-shaped relationship between the time average serum potassium levels and all cause mortality, as seen in the graph on the left here, and a decreasing cardiovascular mortality as potassium levels increased. So you can see that relationship over here. And this is again, data that was extracted from the BRAS PD study. So then what about the GI tract and potassium? How are they linked? Why is it relevant um, in peritoneal dialysis? I did promise talking about it since it does become relevant to our paper. So if we can just very quickly go back to our med school days, back to physiology 101, um, in all muscle cells, um, whether it's skeletal, smooth, um, cardiac muscle cells, um, the depolarization of sodium with potassium gradients are linked to calcium. When a muscle cell is depolarized, calcium is allowed back into the cell through voltage-gated channels, and this increases the intracellular concentration of calcium, which then eventually results in the contraction of these muscle cells through a series of cascades that don't get really too much into, but you can see it here depicted. Now, when the whole body potassium is altered, this sets up the potential to alter the initial sodium potassium depolarization that incites that calcium depolarization that eventually contracts the cell. So in the environment of hypokalemia, specifically in the GI tract, this may ultimately lead to reduced neuroconduction to and within the enteric nervous system, thereby altering, altering the normally highly uh, coordinated reflexes and patterns of the GI motility, with the result linking potassium levels, specifically low potassium levels, to paralytic ileus. Moreover, due to this par paralysis, um, this may then result in bacterial overgrowth and peritonitis through transmural uh, migration of enteric organisms. And uh, I won't give it away too much, but if you think about that, about translocation of organisms, you would think gram-negative um, rods or bacilli, um, but we'll, we'll see what happens later on in the paper itself. But just keep that in mind. So now if we go way back before Physiology 101 med school days, um, back in 1950s, um, Streeton conducted a study on dogs. Um, don't know how ethical that is anymore, but conducted a study on dogs where he fed these dogs a low potassium diet, and he looked at their gastric volume, um, juice volume, pepsin levels. Um, it's kind of difficult to see because this, this graph again is from the 1950s. I don't know if it's hand-drawn, but the graphics just show that uh, serum, as serum potassium um, decreases from feeding these dogs a low potassium diet, Essentially, the volume of gastric juices increases and pepsin decreases in concentration, suggesting a casual relationship in hypokalemia and reduction in GI motility. And then later on in 1971, Lohman took 18 patients who had, this, uh, had a prolonged paralytic ileus after various abdominal surgeries and found that correction of hypokalemia increased intestinal dilation this these patients, again, linking a relationship bet between potassium and intestinal motility. And then finally, when we look at 2015, which is when we talked about the BRAS PD study, um, this is very a very similar graph to the ones that I showed before on cardiovascular and mortality. Um, but essentially, they found that potassium levels that were below four were also a risk factor for PD non-related mortality, infectious mortality, compared to reference range of four to 4.4. So those, again, with levels less than 3.5 had a risk factor, a standard hazard ratio of uh, 2.34. And those with 3.5 to 3.9 had a standard hazard ratio of 1.29. So we didn't analyze the BRAS PD study in detail, but it is an important study because it was one of the first studies that stratified infection mortality into PD and non-PD related um, mortality. So in it, it showed that hypokalemia did not influence mortality related to PD. In contrast, it was strongly related to mortality caused by infections not related to PD. One of the leading theories is that hypokalemia had an effect, had an effect on an impairment of myocardial contractility itself in response to epinephrine, and thus resulted in hemodynamic hyporesponsiveness in patients with septic shock, thus leading to a higher infection-related uh, mortality that was not specifically associated itself directly with uh, PD. It also showed that hypokalemia was, an, in fact, an independent risk factor, even after matching for several important comorbidities, thus reducing the possibility that hypokalemia 
acts only as a surrogate marker for um, other comorbidities. So all in all, we can give hypokalemia a big, a big, big thumbs down. Um, and I hope I can, I've convinced everybody in the audience and virtually that hypokalemia is bad and specifically bad for PD patients um, to have in regards to their cardiovascular and overall mortality. All right, so one would imagine that if we know that hypokalemia is so bad, well, we will prevent hypokalemia at all costs in our PD patients. However, when we look at the prevalence of hypokalemia in our PD patients, we see numbers as high as 36% in some studies, with the BRAS PD study reporting around 5.6%. Um, and the PDOP study, which is shown in the figure here, um, reporting significant country interdifference. Um, but for potassium less than four, ranging anywhere between 24 to 25% of patients in the United Kingdom and Australia and New Zealand, and 35% in Japan and the United States. 39% in Canada, you can see where I'm from, and then specifically in the study that we're looking at, which takes place in Thailand, up to 76% of patients had hypokalemia. Um, for potassium less than 3.5, so the ones that we talked about having that higher standard hazard ratio for cardiovascular mortality, um, they, it, was, it was much less common, except in, again, Thailand, where we see 46% of the PD population having potassium levels less than 3.5. And again, Thailand is the country of interest that we uh, will look into in a bit. So there are certain factors that have been noticed in these studies to be associated with hypokalemia. Um, this is a table from the same study, the PDOP study, um, that included these associations that included being female, being diabetic, having lower blood pressures, a history of CHF, and when interestingly, when more caregivers are involved in um, caring for the PD patients, there seems to be more associations with hypokalemia itself. Hypokalemia was also associated with worse nutritional indices, um, including lower body mass index, body weight, serum albumin, phosphorus, and urea. Interestingly, they were also um, less, they were less likely. So being on a cycler, um, put them at higher risk for being hypokalemic. Um, using icodextrin or um, PD solutions over 2.5% also increased the risk for hypokalemia. And they were also noted to be less prescribed beta blockers and angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or angiotensin II receptor blockers, but were more prescribed loop diuretics more frequently um, with patients with high potassium levels, which again makes sense. So more ACE, more ARBs, high, um, high potassium levels, more loop diuretics, had more hypokalemia incidences. Additionally, um, greater uh, residual kidney function may also um, seem to also be associated with um, less incidences of hypokalemia. And in a study that uh, Wang um, did, uh, he, he found that a significant and independent effect of residual kidney function on actual daily protein intake, um, daily caloric intake, and other nutrient intake, and that seem to support the idea that if you have high residual renal function, you have less incidences of hypokalemia. So this is an infograph um, that was generated from the PDOF study um, with the findings that we mentioned earlier in regards to hypokalemic uh, risk factors, but also to reinforce that the breast PD study, um, that patient that in the breast PD study, um, patients that were with hypokalemia were, had higher um, uh, associations with mortality and peritonitis events. So these findings um, of substantially stronger risk of death, peritonitis, persistent hypokalemia, kind of stirred on this further uh, investigations of interventions to minimize the duration of hypokalemia and identify all these potential modifiable risk factors. So again, really reinforcing that hypokalemia is bad in our patients for all that variety of reasons that we talked about. And, but really, begging the question of then, well, how do we avoid it? And um, what are some strategies that we can use to correct it in our PD patients? So before, in order to truly answer that question, we should first ask, how is potassium managed in our PD patients? As with everything in life, it always becomes a balance of what goes in and what comes out. And patients doing PD are really no different to that. And potassium homeostasis is a balance between urinary and diacetylate losses and dietary intake. So starting with intake, you know, the normal amount of potassium in a 70 kilogram adult healthy male is approximately 3,700 millimoles. Each day, approximately 100 millimoles are consumed and absorbed, driven passively by the concentration gradients across the intestinal mucosa. So we can control how much someone takes in by controlling their diet. Then this is a modifiable um, factor to a certain extent. 
um, depending on how compliant our patients are. Um, but searching gears and quickly looking into how potassium is lost in PD patients. Again, the two main ways are urinary and diacylate losses. So starting by urinary losses, um, this is a graph that I, I stole from um, uh, Rick Johnson on the textbook, but most of our potassium is normally excreted in our kidneys. I won't go into the details of exactly potassium excretion in the nephron, but suffice to say that throughout the nephron, there are multiple mechanisms that passively and actively absorb and secrete potassium. And under high potassium loads, um, aldosterone actively mediates the increased potassium excretion, which can reach as high as 1,000 millimoles per day. Conversely, under low potassium loads, potassium is retained down to a minimum excretion of 10 millimoles a day. However, the normal daily renal excretion is around 90 millimoles per day with the remaining daily potassium excreted in the feces at a rate of 10 millimoles a day. So in essence, if you take an average 70 kilograms healthy male, 100 millimoles goes in daily, 100 millimoles comes out daily. And potassium homeostasis is then achieved in a perfectly functioning person. So in people not on dialysis, the kidney has several autoregulation mechanisms that play an important role in preventing hypokalemia and hyperkalemia, like we mentioned. However, in PD patients, even with the presence of residual renal function, the autoregulation capacity in potassium metabolism is significantly impaired due to a significant loss of potassium through the dialysis, which is not autoregulated. So in PD, Potassium is primarily removed by diffusion, diffusion, like in the left, very basic signs, diffusion, high concentration gradient to low. Actually, in the first hour of a dwell, potassium clearance is higher. Um, and that's probably because of the release of potassium from the cells that line the peritoneal cavity. This release may be promoted by the initial low um, pH and or by the hyperosmolality of the instilled diacylate. Um, but some, some additional potassium is also removed by the ultrafiltration itself. Now, unlike your HD patients, um, peritoneal dialysis patients have a normal, even higher intracellular potassium. And that's likely because of the insulin that's stimulated by the dextrose in our peritoneal infusion. So patients who use cyclers, like I mentioned before, are even sometimes more susceptible to hypokalemia itself because cyclers use a greater number of exchanges with shorter dwell times um, and thus they don't allow for equilibration to occur. Um, there's always a concentration gradient difference between the diacylate and the plasma, allowing more potassium to be transported through the diacylate fluid. So it is, it's not surprising that hypokalemia can easily be developed in patients with some residual renal function and inadequate potassium intake by receiving high dialysis doses. So back in the, the table on the right here is um, a study that was done back in 2014 um, in China. And they looked at continuous um, peritoneal dialysis patients in a single center study and tried to find potential factors within PD um, that resulted in potassium net loss. Um, they found a residual renal function, um, dialysis dose, dialysate to plasma potassium negatively affected this potassium levels. Um, and intracellular volume potassium intake, which kind of makes sense, um, positively affected potassium levels as one would expect. So in summary, these are the things that we can modify to adjust how much potassium enters and leaves our body, the dialysis prescription and the potassium intake. Specifically with um, supplementation that we see all those pills there, uh, which then transitions us to finally to our uh, paper at hand here. So hot off the press, um, in May this year, um, is this article on the efficacy of potassium supplementation in hypoclemic patients receiving peritoneal dialysis, and it was a randomized controlled trial. Um, we're going to take a quick water sip here. Are there any questions in the chat so far? Let's see. Okay. No, no. Cool. All right. I have a question. Yes, not too well for So, uh... And this is about, I, I want you to stay in Physiology 101 the rest of your life. <laughs> because Physiology 101 is going to be where the answers are. Yeah, sure. Now, if, uh, with regards to potassium loss, if you had an effluent uh, volume per day of, say, 12 liters, not, not unreasonable, mm -hmm. and your, your serum potassium is 3.5, I don't care whether it's serum or plasma, I don't care. All right, what is the maximum loss that you would have in that day of potassium to PD? What's the key PD question is? Two milliequivalents of potassium. No, PD is zero. Zero. So 3.5 times 12. 3.5 times 12, what is that? Uh, I, uh, 
or yeah. Okay, that's how much you're losing by dialysis. Yeah. And you just said if you had an intake of 100. Uh, uh, I just want everybody to keep that in mind when you, because that was the example you gave. Yeah. Right. And let's say that you're not eating very well and lose mm -hmm. half of 100. Mm -hmm. It's 50. Yeah. It still is now in excess net. what you're yeah. losing by the dialysis. Right. I want everybody to keep those numbers in mind because they're not very far off. Yeah. All right. All right, carry on. Sounds good. All right, so this is the paper at hand that we'll be talking about. So um, this is a study that was conducted in Thailand, uh, where to remind everyone that in Thailand, the Thai government has chosen PD as the modality of choice since 2007, um, so that the numbers has been increasing since then, um, actually increasing tenfold in the past decade from 1,198 to 26,450 uh, patients. And specifically in Thailand, there are about 346 per million people on dialysis, where the population stands at around 70 million people. So a lot of people is on peritoneal dialysis. It was a multi-center, open-label, randomized controlled trial where they follow patients with bi-monthly labs across six PD clinics in Thailand between January 2020 and May 2021. Um, these were uh, um, the bi-monthly labs um, that they looked at at intervals, including a CVC and essentially what looks like a CMP with some additional labs, including iron levels and uh, parathyroid hormone levels. Due to concerns, um, I highlighted it in the red there, but due to concerns about the possibility of a severe hypoglemic episode um, complicating protocol-based treatment, particularly around the time of the initiation of treatment, serum potassium is additionally measured at one month um, in the interventional group, as just as a safety uh, precaution. So they included, these are the criteria, the inclusion and exclusion criteria. They included patients who are ESKD, they were greater than 18 years old, um, they've been on PD for more than three months, and they had hypokalemia um, in the prior six months um, as defined by a spot serum potassium levels below less than 3.5 and at least three measurements or average serum potassium value below 3.5. Patients that they excluded included patients who had recent peritonitis within the prior three months who were on hybrid um, renal replacement therapy modalities and those patients who were cirrhotics, who had malignancy, chronic infections, or GI diseases. After obtaining patients who met criteria, um, they, random, um, they randomly assigned them in a one-to-one -one ratio, either to receive protocol-based or conventional potassium supplementations. Um, the randomizations were performed using a block of four computer-generated randomization sequences and stratified according to um, PD centers and residual urine output. So in total, about 809 patients were screened, of whom 208 were eligible through the inclusion-exclusion criteria, and 167 of them underwent random. 82 participants were randomized into the conventional potassium treatment arm, um, and 87 were randomized into the protocol-based um, potassium treatment arm. And in the protocol-based um, treatment that I highlighted in the red there, um, seven patients were noted to have some issues with follow-up um, for the variety of reasons there, although all were ended up being included in the overall analysis as this was an intention to treat study. This was the protocol that they used to adjust potassium chloride in the interventional group, essentially divided into the initial and maintenance phase. So patients start off in the initial phase, and then after that, an appointment set, remember that one month um, appointment uh, to enter the continuous phase of potassium supplementation. So potassium supplements included either the elixir form, which was about 20 milliequivalents per 30 cc's, and a tablet form, which is about 6.67 milliequivalents per tablet. In the conventional arm on the right side there, participants were given supplements only when their serum potassium levels fell below low 3.5. Um, although both the dosage regimen and schedule, um, the authors did note that they could be varied depending on the attending physician's clinical judgment. So these were the outcomes that they were uh, essentially looking at. The primary outcome of the study was um, time to first occurrence of peritonitis, which is defined according to the 2016 ISPD. Um, and then secondary outcomes um, included all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, hospitalizations, hemodialysis transfer, um, as defined as transfer to hemodialysis for greater than 84 days, or plan modality switch. Um, safety outcomes that are listed on the right there included um, hyperkalemia, GI events, or side effects. Um, importantly, they did assess um, compliance, um, which was monitored by pill counting, 
and directly interviewing participants with their caregiver's presence. And non-compliance is defined as more than 20%, uh, missing 20 more than 20% of their prescribed doses. Um, all analysis were performed um, on an intentional treat uh, basis. So basically everyone who is randomized in the trial is considered as to be part of the trial, regardless of whether he or she is dosed or completes the trial. Um, all cause mortality was analyzed as a time to event outcome, um, where else uh, peritonitis, free survival, uh, cardiovascular mortality, hospitalizations, AD transfer, HD transfer were analyzed as time to event uh, outcomes as well, but they used the cumulative incidence function, which we had mentioned in the BRAS PD study as well. Um, they did use this formula that I listed down there. I, don't know how they came out of the formula, but um, they did use it to calculate the sample size that they needed for the study, which they estimated um, to be about 83 participants per group. So let's get into the results. This is the um, baseline characteristics that are listed in the table. Um, and as you can see from the p-values there, the baseline characteristics are pretty much balance between the assigned treatment groups or at least not statistically um, significantly different. Um, the, mean, the mean time average potassium, albumin, and general PD prescriptions were very similar um, if you look at them um, in both groups at baseline. But I think it's important to highlight, especially the ones in the green, um, that although not statistically significantly different, that the control group had higher, number one, residual urine output, that high incidence of diabetes, that high use of diuretics, and they had lower use of potassium supplements and RAS blockades, which all amounts to hypokalemia, as we had previously discussed before this paper. Um, I think it's also important to note that the median follow-up time was 401 days, which is about 13.3 months. The range of that being anywhere between 10 and a half to 13.9 months. Remembering that sample size that they calculated of 83 um, used as a framework was calculated based on a follow-up time of 12 months. And there was apparently no difference in follow-up time between the two groups, although again, the range of it is quite wide in both groups, with the mean being 378 in the reactive and 407 in the protocol group. But like, if you look at the reactive group, it goes anywhere, the range goes anywhere between 276 days to 471 days. So the, the range is quite wide in both groups. So during the study period, um, if we look at figure two here, um, the, the average serum potassium level in the intervention group did increase to 4.04 at the first four weeks and remain at levels ranging from 4.23 to 4.45 thereafter. And by comparison, when you look at the control group, um, the average serum potassium level ranged from 3.47 to 3.74. And the time averaged serum potassium levels throughout the study period was 3.97 um, and 3. 0.47 in an interventional and uh, control groups, respectively. And this was statistically significant. So the protocol group, in summary, had higher potassium levels at the end of it than the, the control group. Peritonitis did occur in uh, 13 participants in the interventional group and 24 participants in the control group during the follow-up period. So the median time to first peritonitis was significantly longer in the protocol group, being 223 days versus 133 days in the reactive group. This is basically demonstrated by the graphic um, that you see in figure three here, um, which shows the incidence uh, curve of peritonitis free survival between the two groups. So, <clears throat> however, when we look at overall peritonitis rates um, in the third point there, um, you can see that um, it was not statistically significant or different between the two groups. Um, 0.24 in a protocol arm versus 0.42 in the reactive arm per patient year at risk. Interestingly, if we pull up the table um, in table two here, which kind of reemphasizes that what I just said, um, gram-positive um, bacteria were the predominant organisms in the intervention group, whereas the main pathogens in the control group was gram-negative um, bacilli. Although again, I'm not sure if this was um, really too significant because the numbers were very small. Um, for example, um, five to four and, and seven to nine um, seems like a, a very small rate. Um, but of note, if, if we remember from what I talked about earlier from the BRAS PD study earlier, um, the study had found that persistent hypokalemia was associated with higher peritonitis risk caused by any organisms, but tended to be more associated with gram-positive organisms, interestingly. And this is important because, again, like we said, if we're postulating that hypokalemia 
is resulting from reduced gut motility and dust translocation of bacteria, one would expect gram-negative organisms to be higher. And in fact, it does seem to be higher in this study, which is a different finding from the BRAS PD study. Although again, maybe not significant. Uh, yeah. One of the symptoms of hyperkalemia is weakness. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I look hard to see whether cognitive deficits were, and I, I couldn't find anything. I, yeah. But oh, yeah. certainly weakness. Yes, yeah. And if you're weak and not doing an exchange properly, I would expect yeah. that, that a gram positive to be the consequence of that. Yeah, that's that's very true. I didn't really think about that too much. I was very hyper-focused on gut motility, but that, that actually would make sense too. Well, and gut yeah. motility and constipation, straining in stool, then the transmural migration of the organism. Yeah. So I think you're thinking right, but all the yeah. weakness and the inability to do proper exchanges. Yes, that, that's a very good point if the audience didn't hear, but um, uh, Dr. Gopra is just mentioning why GPCs could also be um, found in peritonitis events because of weakness and, and improper exchangers, if, you know, if people couldn't hear that. So um, when we look at the secondary outcomes here in this table three here, um, we didn't find any significant differences um, with respect to any of them, including all-cause mortality, um, cardiovascular death, hospitalizations, um, and HD transfer between participants in both groups. Adverse events are depicted in uh, table four here. Um, and as listed, potassium supplements were generally well tolerated for the most part in both groups with no significant difference in the groups for any of the events. Although something to note is that three participants in the interventional group were withdrawn from the study because of diarrhea, um, as we had mentioned before. Um, there was, I did mention that there was some imbalance, even though it wasn't statistically significantly different in the baseline characteristics. Um, as mentioned before, there was some um, overall baseline uh, imbalance between in respect to the age and diabetes. Um, and I did list some other factors too, but they specifically looked at age and diabetes. So sensitivity study uh, analysis was performed to adjust for these parameters, um, which demonstrated very similar findings, although the result of peritonitis was not statistically significant in this case of uh, hazard ratio of 0.52. So I guess the question is, what did this study achieve or um, demonstrate? Well, I'm just going to summarize the results really quickly here. And in the interventional group, we saw a longer time to peritonitis um, compared to the reactive control group. Um, they also found a lower hazard ratio of peritonitis and a greater proportion of peritonitis-free participants. However, no statistically significant difference uh, were found in the secondary outcomes or in peritonitis rate um, per patient year. And they attributed this lack of um, significance due to a small sample size um, and the trial duration maybe being too short. Um, the, main difference, the mean difference in uh, serum potassium levels at the end of the study between the interventional group and control group was about 0.66, being the, the interventional group having a higher potassium level. So I guess um, essentially the study concluded that the potassium supplementation was effective um, in preventing PE-associated peritonitis. And they postulated that potential mechanisms of this beneficial effect of protocol-based potassium supplementation on time to first peritonitis episodes included, number one, um, we've, we've gone through this a lot, be in this to the bush, but essentially um, improvement in gut motility um, resulting in that reduction in bacterial translocation. Um, number two, improvement in muscle strength um, leading to better performance of high quality PD that Dr. Goldberg had mentioned. Um, and then number three, um, improvement of cellular function, including immune defenses against pathogens was what they postulated to help prevent peritonitis. There were some strengths that were highlighted by the authors themselves. Um, firstly being that this was the first RCT that evaluated the effect of potassium treatment on peritonitis outcomes. It was also a multi-centered study. Um, although it was only in Thailand, they did recruit participants from six different um, PD centers. Um, number three, um, patients at, at high risk of peritonitis were recruited using objective definition of hypokalemia. Um, number four, adherence. Um, according to the authors, um, they did note it to be excellent, but they, they did note it to be at 82%. Um, and the results were also analyzed and intentional attention to treat basis. And finally, um, the primary outcome of peritonitis is considered by 
clinicians, patients, and caregivers in the Song PD initiative to be the topmost criteria, uh, in critical research outcome in PD. And the Song PD, um, for those that are not familiar, it's a workshop that was done back at where I'm from in Vancouver, Canada, back in 2018 that established a core um, outcome set of trials um, in PD based on shared priorities in all the stakeholders, including um, the physicians, the patients themselves, and the all core outcomes ended up being um, PD-treated uh, related infections, um, cardiovascular disease, mortality, technique survival, and um, live participation. However, there were some limitations that the author themselves identified and some that I thought about as well. Um, first, the sample size was uh, calculated assuming no competing events, um, but also was the sample size large enough, especially in regards to the peritonitis events, um, to generate a conclusion. Um, second, although the site investigators were not informed of the randomization block size, um, which was fixed at four, it is possible that they may have been able to predict um, the assignment of sequential uh, participants. Um, third, the open label design may have introduced some observer and performance biases. Uh, fourth, potassium wasn't measured in urine, PD effluent, and diet, which ties into the next point on whether we can apply this broadly um, given the cultural uh, dietary differences. Um, fifth, given the small number of peritonitis events, it is difficult to support and reject the hypothesized mechanisms of hypokalemia-associated peritonitis. And additionally, because it was conducted, um, this study was 2022, but it was conducted before that um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the authors did note that there was some difficulty with follow-up with some patients who were in hotspot areas. Um, although none was truly lost to follow up, as noted before, it is uncertain whether interval data um, was missing. For some of the affected participants, outpatient PD visits were postponed for a few weeks. And so I don't know how that affected data collection in that bi weekly um, or bi monthly uh, labs. So um, although the, the investigators didn't know that they used telemedicine and drug delivery to ensure that they were, they were following the protocol. But again, since this was an intention to treat analysis, I think that missing data from some participants does become somewhat important. So um, the other thing too, is that I, I couldn't really find any data regarding baseline transport status of some participants, um, of all the participants in either groups. And this perhaps could have affected um, potassium levels in either um, groups. I just thought that with peritonitis events sometimes can lead to higher, faster transport statuses, and that perhaps could affect some potassium levels and recurrent peritonitis and things like that. Um, and finally, this study was conducted on patients on continuous PD. Um, so I wonder if being on a cycle would have any effect on um, the results, given that, uh, as we mentioned before, patients on cyclers um, have greater number of changes and shorter dwells that can lead to higher levels of hypokalemia. But, but, uh, but they have less connections. And it, as, as long as it's uniform, you're mm -hmm. studying one population. To That's true, yeah. and, and so if peritonitis was their primary outcome, wouldn't you want to look at, at patients who are likely to have more? Have more. Yeah, right. That's the multiple exchanges in CAPD. Right. That's very true. I just thought about being patients on cyclers, maybe having high incidences of hypokalemia, maybe higher risk of parasites. But again, if you compare, like you said, it's the same population, the same population, it shouldn't really matter. But I just thought whether this could be applied broadly to patients on cyclers too, which probably could. <laughs> so uh, I want to make a couple of comments. Uh, and I want us to stay in Physiology 101. I really was not joking when I, I appeal to all of you to think physiologically. It's yeah. going to be the answer to your question more often than not. So uh, let's think for a minute of where uh, aldosterone uh, affects potassium excretion. Mm. Okay, let's name some organs above and beyond the kidney where potassium leaving the body was under the influence of uh, aldosterone. There's at least a couple. Can you guys think of some? The gut, yeah. The gut, and predominantly the colon, probably more likely the transverse colon. Mm -hmm. What? Where else? Mm -hmm. Very important if you live in Southeast Asia. Skin. Mm -hmm. So you guys, uh, and by the way, Matt Luther is the best person at Vanderbilt to talk to you about aldosterone. So any guy, you guys bump into Matt, you you just suck his brain, okay? <laughs> uh, so 
uh, aldosterone was discovered uh, by American scientists at the end of World War II when they were looking at how soldiers adapted to uh, warm environments like deserts. Mm -hmm. And they found that there was a sterol associated in the blood going up at the same time that your sweat uh, electrolyte concentration changed so that you would excrete more potassium through your sweat and less sodium because you're trying to preserve volume in the heat. And that ultimately that was aldosterone. And so I would argue that K losses, and that's why I made nice to do the math yeah. on K losses. If, if you're in Southeast Asia, I'm gonna imagine that your K losses are, are perhaps even greater through the skin mm -hmm. than any other part of your body. It, in the absence of kidney function. Yeah. And and I hope I convinced you that the peritoneal loss are are that's really not what's going on. Yeah. We we kind of calculated right about maybe 50 million bullets. Maybe. Yeah. All right. And so so something else is going on. What else could that be? Why why would PD uh, independent of yeah. kidney function? What is there about PD that's different than stage five CKD and perhaps different than hemodialysis? There are some other differences. What might those be physiologically that can affect potassium? I mean, you're using glucose. Glucose, yeah. glucose is one. Okay, and and uh, that so any is important. Think about the PD patients that you're seeing, whether mm -hmm. they're in the hospital or over in the clinic. Are their electrolytes look like uh, hemodialysis patients? No. What's different about it? They're more hypoplemic. <laughs> Hyperphosphatemia, but I'm not sure the relationship to potassium. Maybe there is one. What else? How about acid base? Aren't, aren't your hemo patients uh, uh, really uh, suffering from metabolic acidosis? Mm -hmm. And what about the PD patients? What what would you say uh, as a typical bicarbonate level in a PD patient? High twenties. High twenties for yeah. sure. Okay. So so they're they're acid base in better control. Yeah. And so maybe they're keeping K inside cells better. Oh, all right. See? Yeah. And uh, so maybe the hemo patients, when you see a hemo patient with a potassium of 5.5, five, maybe they're not hyperkalemic in the yeah. sense of body, total body. Just more maybe cellular. it's just in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the PD patients, maybe that potassium's in the right place. Yeah. Okay, I want you guys to think that way. And then the other problem I have with the study, because first I think the study attempted to prove what it was trying to prove, yeah. but is, in our program, well, I had, I'll, I'll bet I had a third of my patients on spironolactone, mm. which to me would be a hundred times easier than taking these potassium pills. Because, you know, it's a very long acting agent. If these, even if they took it every third day, mm. they would get a benefit from it. You might need a higher dose, right. but you'd get a benefit from it. Do you guys know uh, what the incidence of uh, uh, spironolactone use is over in the on the internet? No, is is sure. Osama on the uh, or Dr. Salani either one? Can they answer? Dr. Salami is on, I think. Wait, I, you're asking about the incidence of spironolactone use in our unit? Yes, I am. I I don't know. Why we don't? I don't. I don't have a compilation of that data. How about some of the other uh, programs around the country? Rebel? Can you see? Uh, let's see who's on. Doctor, you do you do you use? No. No, we don't use spironolactone. Because yeah. I, I don't recall during training that we used it really well. Uh, because, I mean, that, that will play a role only in the people who are not making urine, isn't it? But oh, yes. we do not use. I'm sorry, unless you are talking about the cardioprotective well, effect. I mean, that's, that's my point. But not because of potassium. It, it, spironolactone blocks aldosterone effect at the skin and at the gut level. It, so it, you are saying yeah, the problem is that most people with on peritoneal dialysis, you must acknowledge that they tend to be constipated. So it doesn't matter how much 
aldosterone is playing there. Even if the concentration increases to from 40 to 100 milliequivalent per liter, the total amount of volume of a stool is so low that I will increase the potassium expression only by two or three per day. Therefore, the effect of espironolactone there must be significant. Second, you really have to prove the effect of espironolactone on sweat. Three, if they don't make urine, I don't see the effect. Sorry. Yeah. And we have Dr. Oliveira, I know she's one of the fellows at Rush. Uh, do, you, do you see a lot of uh, home patients on spironolactone? Hey, I'm just on um, um, one of my co-fellows' phones, but oh, we, we don't use aldactone that often in our PD patients. Um, maybe a couple of our hemo patients we're reaching for, but that's mostly for hypertension control, not so much for hypokalemia. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now I have as a, a point to make here. Um, Go ahead, Nye. It's maybe like a different perspective on things and a counter argument to whether or not hypoclemia is bad in terms of your background. Um, you did mention that people who are hypoclemics were more likely to have lower serum albumin, have more caregivers. Mm -hmm. It sounds to me like they're more likely sicker. So do you think that hypoclemia yeah. might just be a manifestation of them having poor appetite, not eating, and right. that might be the reason they're dying? Having yeah. yeah, for sure. I think that's a good point to bring up um, because, like we mentioned in the factors from before, um, a lot of them do point at sicker and more chronically sick patients. So, so I'd like to follow up on that. This is Rachel. Um, Naya, if I was thinking about that as well, um, and if you look at, uh, you know, they, they looked at time average potassium, but if you look at table one, um, I can't see that they did time averaged albumin, right? So, so, um, there, there are the physiologic issues, but then there's a whole other issue of nutrition and how the patients are getting the potassium and how healthy they are. And I would have loved to have seen, you know, the albumin is pretty much the same in both the intervention, and the cold control group at baseline. I'm really curious to know what the time averaged albumin was because that could potentially capture some of the things that the um, the concerns the group is raising about um, about how healthy the patient is and what their overall nutrition is um, independent of the potassium. Um, there was a, another comment about, I think Requel, Requel, par pardon me if I am pronouncing this wrong, asked about checking the potassium in the control group at specified days. I looked and I couldn't really, it wasn't clear to me. And so that's sort of an extension of my question about the album. And I, I would love to know just a little bit more about, um, about some of the lab values, um, some of the potassium. And then if I can just tease out to follow up on this conversation about GI events, from what I could tell in table four, the GI events that were that they're talking about were um, were when the patients got potassium supplementation and had trouble with it. Um, but I don't see that they really teased out the difference between um, constipation and not having constipation, which is something I'm I'm also kind of curious about. It's there's a you know there's a scale for that. Um, and I know Nuper in Indianapolis is doing a study um, looking at that. So you can sort of turn that from a qualitative variable into a quantitative variable. And that um, wasn't sort of a step that they did in this study, but that speaks to this issue of, you know, gram positive versus gram negative, um, whether we're blocking the, um, the potassium channels in the gut, um, and, and that that was different, right? The intervention group, it was higher. There were more adverse events. I think that was adverse events in relation to the potassium supplementation, but um, I would be curious to know how much of that was constipation. Um, also to talk to Dr. Yu's, uh, to speak to Dr. Yu's point about GI, the GI tract. Just be curious. I mean, it would be helpful for them to give that information because it could either it could potentially support, you know, the the hypothesis that they're testing. So, some thoughts. Thank you, Dr. Pascal. No, those were really good points that you raised too. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I have a quick question. So the question in the chat also was the timing of the, the lab 
collection was it they weren't collected during dialysis right it was that set time yeah the clinic. So, right. so is the theory that potassium is lower than 3.5 in during the intradialytic this is continuous. It continu it's continuous peritoneal dialysis. So they're getting doused every day. Yeah. 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 And, and uh, unless there are hormonal reasons for variation in potassium, uh, uh, I want to challenge something Russell said about auto regulation. When you said in PD there is an auto regulation of potassium levels, sure there is. If the blood potassium yes. levels go up, there's going to be a diffusion gradient even sure. more. Yeah. So it is in a way auto regulated. But if you were to look at the separate hormones, so if you take BUN, which is not uh, there, if you have somebody on CAD, their BUN is within just a few milligrams per DL 24 hours a day. So potassium is not from hormonal influences, so it might vary a little bit more. But for example, creatinine and, and BUN would not. Hmm. Perhaps BUN has to be able to creatinine would. So it is pretty continuous in CAPD. And that's why that's part of the reason they took this population mm -hmm. is because had they done cycle patients like you just said, and they were dry during the day, then I could see the potassium going up from the time they left dialysis. Yeah. Then. A different but that's part of the reason they looked at this population. So, so to me, then it sounds pretty, pretty convincing that even keeping patients with a potassium at three point five, that's too low for them. That's you know, yeah, the court, yeah. That right. We should aim for higher like boards, yeah. And the other thing, and I, I think it's it's less of an issue, and I don't remember if they mentioned it, but the prescription, right? The um, how was the prescription changed at all? during the the course of the study in terms of the pd prescription itself oh the P and, no yeah right? so you know the with with the exposure to more how how would the effect of exposure to more dextrose right in the solution affect this but then again they are checking it uh in terms of uh, the outcome at the end of the day is potassium right and if you're going to do a study like this and look at potassium levels for patients um it has to be something that mimics uh, a realistic uh, uh, approach, which is the truth of the matter is we change potassium. I'm sorry, we change PD prescriptions all the time, and in the study, right? They're they're adjusting based on potassium levels, which is a much more realistic approach to what we're seeing. So, um, I would say um, it's kind of a that's kind of a side issue, uh, and the applicability of this to patients who are on cyclers though that remains to be seen right that's where the the whole thing about when did you check it was it right after they came off the cycler uh, or did we wait a little bit after they came off the cycler right the yeah. applicability of that that's where that changes a little bit all right uh, again if i may number one the table two that shows the causes of peritonitis is a little bit interesting isn't it that uh, they got two each group had, had two cases of fungal peritonitis that for us, that is extremely high, but I guess is more common in Thailand. Then they have the control group, one case of tuberculosis that I guess has nothing to do with what we're talking about. I don't see how uh, peritonitis related to tuberculosis is related to what we're talking transmural, but maybe I'm wrong. And then there is a much higher percentage of no growth in the culture. That suggests to me that maybe they were over exaggerating in terms of making the diagnosis of peritonitis, but maybe I'm wrong. Because one of the issues here is that it is true, it is randomized, but second, it is open label. And there's no way to avoid knowing what is happening with this open label. You're either getting a continuous potassium supplement or you are not. So any damn nephrologist who's following this patient will know is the patient on the intervention or on the control group. So you may expect some potential actions in relation to that. And uh, so that is a point of some importance in my mind. Yeah, I think that may be part of what, I was thinking about that too, Dr. Yu, part of why Raquel was asking about sort of checking the potassium in the con controlled group at specified days, because you would think that the patients that were getting the intervention with more scheduled potassium would get potassium levels if the nephrologist was just a little bit concerned it might be too high. Um, so I think that's that's a fair point. 
I posted the transplant rate um, from the USRDS in the chat. That's the link to it. And um, you know, Russell, great, great intro. That was such a good setup for the um, for the study. One of the points you made was how much higher PD is in the US um, compared to Taiwan. And part of that is because the transplant rate is so much higher in the US than in, I'm sorry, and uh, Thailand. Uh, Thailand, sorry, Thailand, also Taiwan. Um, and that's important for two reasons. One, because it meant that in a way their study was cleaner, right? What if we had to talk about transplant as a competing risk? It would make this much harder. They sort of did it in a country where that whole variable of phase change and outcome was just not much of an issue. Um, but then the other thing is that to follow up on um, Naive's point and what some of us have been talking about with skeletal muscle and weakness and functional capacity in, in, in some studies, you can use being listed for transplant as a sort of an intermediate outcome or a marker for health. And so if you don't quite have the data on how functional the people were and um, you know, did they have a PD helper, if they were listed for transplant, they probably are more functional, more healthy, they probably have a higher um, albumin. And that's a variable that we just, we didn't see in this probably because it's um, so few patients get listed in the country where this was done. So, I want to, uh, sorry to mean to interrupt, but just in the interest of everyone's time, because it's one o'clock now, two o'clock Eastern. So I wanted to uh, thank Russell, first of all, for a great presentation, uh, really, you know, great background um, and breakdown of the paper that we talked about today. I want to thank Dr. Yu, Dr. Fussell, Dr. Golper, and everybody mm -hmm. who uh, participated and contributed to our discussion today. Um, you know, I know I learned a lot uh, from everyone and from this study. Um, and uh, I want to say stay tuned for next month's uh, journal club. We're going to move it actually uh, a couple of weeks back, but everyone who's on here is going to get an email to update you. And we're going to be talking about uh, embedded PD catheters. We'll take it from Thank there. You. Thank you. Thank, Thank you all very much. Uh, uh, Dr. Elchami has got it fixed, so it's being recorded and uh...